Hi, I am here with Britain's much-loved soprano, Leslie Garrett, and national treasure, and of course, CBE. Now, <laughs> Leslie performs in operas all over the world, musical theatre, concerts, television appearances, and of course, an outstanding recording career with 14, I think, solo albums alone. She's won every award almost going. And um, on top of that, she's had her own television show, has performed in Strictly, Celebrity Masterchef um, and Loose Women. And we have her here in Manchester ready for My Fair Lady coming to the Palace Theatre from the 22nd of March to the 1st of April. So thank you for joining us today, <laughs> Leslie. Thank you very much, Carol. That was a wonderful introduction. <laughs> well, it's made me sound like I've had a career. That's wonderful. <laughs> you have, you have. So, of course, My Fair Lady, it is the much-loved story of Eliza Doolittle, a cottony flower girl who dreams of being a societal lady, and enter Professor Higgins, who is a linguistics professor, and can you tell us the rest of what we can expect with this story? Well, it is, a, as you say, a, a very well-known and much-loved story uh, based, of course, on uh, Pygmalion of George Bernard Shaw uh, from early in uh, last century. Uh, and yes, it tells the, the story of, um, I think, of a, a woman's determination to get on in life in the society in which she finds herself. She recognises that she has to speak in a better way uh, and behave in a different way. Um, perhaps I should say speak and behave in a different way. There's nothing wrong with the way she was in the beginning nope. to me, but anyway. <laughs> but I know what you mean. Has, in that society, she has, yeah, she has to perform in a different way if she wants to get on and uh, and make money and uh, improve her lot, basically. So she uh, approaches a linguistics professor, as you said, Professor Higgins, that she bumped into literally outside Covent Garden when she was selling flowers and uh, forms a relationship with him and his friend, uh, Colonel Pickering, and indeed with their housekeeper, Mrs. Pierce, which is the role I play. Um, and between them, they... Uh, they create um, a, a lady, uh, I suppose you would call it, uh, a society lady of the time. And she's able to fool everyone because she studies so hard uh, and is so determined to, um, to get on in life. Uh, and she indeed does. She eventually goes to a grand hall um, uh, in the in an embassy and uh, there's an expert in linguistics and Another linguistics expert there, Zoltan Karpati, who is renowned for being able to tell uh, charlatans, uh, linguistic charlatans, and he is convinced she's a princess. So she succeeds in what she aimed to do, but it comes at a price. And there's quite a lot of heartache um, and uh, confrontation, I suppose, conflict, inner conflict for her. Yeah. Uh, with all the other participants... Um, uh, share uh, and our producer, our director rather, uh, Bartlett Share, has been very keen to, uh, to draw on the original Pygmalion um, and to, I suppose, de-sugar the, the story, if you like, from the way it was dealt with in the famous film from the fifties, fifties and sixties. Um, uh, so. Really, what our show is about is strong women. Um, Eliza herself is a, clearly a very strong, determined woman. But my character, Mrs. Pierce, and also Henry Higgins' mother, Mrs. Higgins, we're all three extremely strong, independent women, which is what uh, Pygmalion is all about. Shaw was a, a, a ahead of his time. He was an ardent feminist. He's a big supporter of women's suffrage. Um, and... Uh, Bartlett Sherry is able to get a little suffragette march into one of the crowd scenes. So he's he's very much uh, taking a shore at his original word uh, and making this a modern, a more modern tale. It still, of course, has those the terrible class distinctions that that were prevalent at the time. You, you, you know, it's in a way it is a piece of history, but we've got a, a lot of uh, of uh, more modern views on the drama that I hope will, well, I'm sure has been uh, uh, um, a 
appealing to uh, our modern walk audience. Um, and we've also got some wonderful scenes where there's cross-dressing and sort of transgender um uh, jollity going on <laughs> uh, so yeah it's it's not uh, entirely the traditional um stereotypical piece that people might think it, it yeah. is excellent well there's a reason straight away to come and watch as if there's not enough anyway um and obviously you've for mentioned- me i have so i was just gonna say for me it's particularly poignant to be doing this uh this this wonderful production because um i first did my fair lady fi- exactly 50 years ago when i was at school when i was 16 wow. uh, i was i played eliza and then the next time i did my fair lady i've done it three times was in the hollywood bowl 20 years later with the los angeles philharmonic and john malcheri conducting and jonathan price playing higgins <laughs> <laughs> um and uh, uh, and, and I played Eliza again there. Uh, I'm now a uh, third time lucky. I'm 50 years since the beginning. I'm now playing the wonderful Mrs. Pierce. Fierce Pierce, we call Fierce, it. Fierce. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <coughs> well, I'm going to come to that. So you've given me a beautiful segue there. So thank you. Because <laughs> um, I was going to say, obviously, Mrs. Pierce is um, maybe a little disapproving of Eliza at first. However, she is one of the champions of actually kind of the only one who really looks out for her and, mm. and looks out for her. So what else can you tell us about her relationship with Eliza? Well, you're right. Absolutely. She starts off by being affronted by what she sees is as Eliza's cheek. Eliza comes marching up to the front door and uh, comes in and demands to see Professor Higgins and then uh, says she wants him to give her lessons and she's prepared to pay for them. And Mrs. Uh, Pierce just thinks this is this is shocking behaviour from a young woman, and she's very disapproving. But then she begins to appreciate just how determined Eliza is to better herself, mm. and um, also she can see that Professor Higgins is very keen to try. And well, he, she, she's basically the subject of a bet, um, Colonel. And that's a little bit unsavoury to me, but Colonel Pickering. Uh, <laughs> Uh, bets Higgins he can't uh, work his magic and won't be able to pass her off uh, at the embassy ball so uh, Higgins takes this bet on uh, and Mrs Pierce is not entirely uh, happy about this she has a wonderful line where she says um, uh, Mr Higgins you can't take a girl up like that as if you were picking up a pebble off a beach and she sees her as a human being from the start. Actually, as does Pickering, in fairness. But um, uh, she does look out for her and does say, you know, things like, um, what's, what's, what's to become of her when you've finished your teaching? You know, she's the only one who's looking ahead yeah. of the experiment and, and it, into this girl's future. So, yes, yeah, she, she's a caring person. She's a very responsible person. Mrs. Pierce, this is my character. And she doesn't want to see Higgins, who she's very devoted to, um, treating somebody as if they were an object rather than a human being. Um, And I think uh, she introduces that into the care of Eliza. For instance, Mrs. Pierce baths her. We have a wonderful shower scene and she she cleans her and she dresses her and she looks after her appearance and she gets her ready for the ball and she, she shows her how to become a lady. Uh, and uh, of those times, uh, whilst I think uh, still respecting, you know, where she's come from yeah. and how she's um, been determined to um, to to do better for herself than being a flower seller. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's a lot of mutual respect between Eliza and Mrs. Pierce because El- Eliza sees that Mrs. Pierce is, a, is an independent, strong woman. And I think that's what, exactly what Eliza is looking to be. Yeah, definitely. <coughs> Throughout all of this, there's obviously these just untouchable songs that are just even now beautifully written. And I mean, you've got on the street where you live, show me. Um, take me to the get me to the church on time. I mean, oh, they, they, could have danced all night. Yeah, could have danced all night. Yes. Yeah, yeah. so, do yeah. you have a favourite? 
I do love it if I could I do love it. I could have danced all night partly because that's the, that's the one song I get to sing four bars in <laughs> <laughs> they've mislaid Mrs Pierce's aria sadly so um, apart from singing along with all the choruses which I can't help but do that I actually get I only get uh, four bars to sing of my own <laughs> But I make the most of them, don't you worry. But I'm, I, yes, of course, I'd love to have a bit more to sing, but I absolutely love this production. I love this score. It is a masterpiece of a score. Mm. Um, and uh, the, the musical standards of this uh, piece, of this production, are extremely high. We've got a very, very fine uh, music director, Alex Parker, uh, and a very committed uh, band um, and we every before every performance we are uh, we do a compulsory warm up a physical one and a vocal one uh, and we have notes about the previous no- previous performance previous night's performance what we could do better uh, both musically and physically uh, we we are constantly rehearsing uh, things that didn't go quite right or that we think could be improved so the attention to to detail of the production and of the musical values is of the highest order and to be honest I wouldn't be in this if it weren't because yeah. you know that's what I'm all about um, but uh you're absolutely right. These are timeless songs, even if they are it, it, it referring to a past time, they still, in a sense, are timeless. Um, and I just love every single one. Um, uh, you, you know, you have to, you have to, re- we all recognise that, you know, time has moved on, society has changed. But, it, you know, it's interesting to look back and see where the journey that we've all been on in the last hundred years. And this was the beginning of it. This was for women. This was the time of women's suffrage, as I say. It was a time when women were starting to uh, uh, really uh, stand up and be counted and be independent. Uh, and that's another reason I'm very happy to be in this production, because feminism is absolutely, you know, my second <laughs> second name. So I'm completely... Um, committed to you know to being able to promote that so it's great (laughs) and and I think that you know you've touched on a lot of the way that this production has has, um, been approached slightly differently to previous ones and again you've you've already mentioned but that is down to the just incredible direction of Bartlett Cher who's whole new world's coming out of his ears I mean I know the man can't move for them (laughs) is incredible what has it been like working with him we didn't get very long. Um, I wasn't in the in the cast during the summer that performed at the Coliseum, but he did very kindly come back and rehearse for a couple of weeks with uh, with the, the new cast, the tour cast, which included included myself uh, and of course Michael Savia, uh, or just absolutely wonderful cast. Charlotte Kennedy is playing Eliza. Michael's playing Higgins. Uh, we've got the great Adam Woodyatt, Ian Beale from EastEnders playing. Uh, uh, Mr. Doolittle, Alfred Doolittle, and of course John Middleton, yes. uh, Ashley from e- from um, Emmerdale. He's playing Colonel Pickering. So there, there are just absolutely wonderful performers yeah. in in this show. Um, you know, this is a very strong cast. But strong as we are, I have to say the ensemble, uh, which who play a, a huge diverse range of different roles, everything from grand ladies in the ball to costermongers and flower sellers in Covent Garden uh, and barrow boys in Covent Garden uh, and everything in between, including all the servants in the house uh, my, that I'm in charge of. Uh, you know, the, the ensemble is of the highest quality I, I think I've ever worked with. They, they're young people who are dancing and singing their hearts out every single night. Uh, are of a, the, the, the talent, the depth and range of their talent is astonishing. And every every performance, I feel uh, really privileged to be with these fantastic young people um, who make the show what it is. The energy they bring is extraordinary. Um, and yeah, and I, I have to really pull my socks up to keep up with them <laughs> but that's what life's all about to me you know it's, it's all about the next challenge uh, and this is a challenge eight shows a week is a yeah. good deal more than I'd ever do as an opera singer um uh, and and I think just the feeling that we're we're promoting good ideals with this you know the ideal of excellence for a start in the in the standards that we achieve musically and dramatically but but just also that we're we're, as as we've been saying you know we're 
we're championing women's rights um, and, and that we still need to do, you know, despite the fact that uh, Pygmalion is well over 100 years old, you know, we still have, don't have equal pay, we don't have pay parity, there's all, you know, the, we don't, don't I, I would love to get into that, but perhaps <laughs> we don't need to for your interview, but there are so many ways in which, you know, women still have to fight for their rights, um, yes. so yeah. That, that's worth championing whatever stage of your career you're at <laughs> absolutely absolutely it, yeah you, you couldn't yeah. have said it better it really is um and you've obviously touched on some of the cast that well uh the, well the, the main cast and the ensemble and everything and i think as well it works because you've got a ray a diverse range of backgrounds as to people's expertise where they've come from um, yes and and i also wanted to touch on yours because this is just this is just kind of a question that I'm curious about, really. Um, I know as Mrs. Pierce, you don't do lots of singing within this production, but obviously you have in musical theatre before. Yes. Is there a technical transition from opera to musical theatre or, um, you know, ballads or pop songs? How, technically, how does that work? I'm just really interested. Well, I always call myself an opera singer because that was my training and to be honest that's my passion mm. um it's unfortunate that there are just no roles for uh sopranos of my age uh there are older roles for mezzos but I'm still a soprano mm. but to be honest the roles in opera for mezzos are mostly bad ladies and witches and, <laughs> you know we, we can do better than that and I have been championing the idea that if opera wants to continue to be uh, or to be seen as a contemporary art form it has to reflect contemporary society and older women are enormously powerful now in society as a whole you know <laughs> we run Europe for goodness sake <laughs> you know we run various countries where heads of state where you know we're captains of industry we you know we're prime ministers so you know older women really need to have a voice in drama of all kinds, but particularly in opera, because we we are strong, we are vital to society, um, and you can't just you know shuffle us off once we you know we we're past childbearing years because that's <laughs> just really not on. Um, so <clears throat> uh, to answer your question though, I always approach every kind of music I perform with the attitude that it's my job to find out what the composer he or she wants from me in terms of the quality of my sound, the timbre of my voice, the colours that I can provide. Uh, I, am at, I am at their disposal, really. It's an interesting relationship that between the artist and the composer because it's, it's totally symbiotic. We can't exist without each other. You know, the, uh, music is just scribble on a page until a performer makes makes sense of it and and makes it come alive makes yeah. it audible um and in the same way you know i have to have something to sing i have to have some music otherwise all i'm doing is la 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 you know so <laughs> or a vocalese which i'm only cut myself never seen the point of vocalese as to be honest it's all about the words for me so, yeah. oh, hang on. Stage principal warm up. That's your call to stage principal warm up. Thank oh gosh, you. you got to go. I'm, I, I'm, I should go. How much more of you do That's you need? fine. That's fine. We can leave it. We do not want to keep you from my fair lady because we want to come and watch. Oh, so, please come. Actually, can, shall I just finish that though? Yes. Um, so let me just finish that. So whatever sort of music I'm uh, attempting to sing, um, I adapt my sound. Uh, not, not the instrument but the sound the instrument makes i i try and find the quality that composer wants now i don't sing uh bach in the same way as i sing puccini so why should i sing handel in the same way you know i wouldn't sing handel in the same way as i sing sting for instance <laughs> i love yeah. fields of gold i put it in all my performances or you know rogers and hamstein you have to find the right quality for each composer that's my job um and i will use my voice to do that uh but i still rely on the, the basic training that i've had and that i continued to to develop all my life i still have singing lessons every week uh and I, in order to keep my voice flexible uh, and strong 
the muscles that govern the larynx are, it's, it's just like being an athlete. You have to keep them uh, exercised like, like any other physical activity. And if you don't use it, you lose it. So uh, <laughs> for the last 50 years, I've been, I've been singing every day. Uh, so my voice is strong, steady, clear, bright, uh, as it always has been. Uh, and I, you know, I continue to put that at the at the disposal of anybody who'd like to write for me. I have had some lovely roles written for me as an older woman. I am getting through. <laughs> so I think my, fa- my favourite one was um, when I played the role of a toilet attendant in a gay nightclub. It was a wonderful opera written for me by Mark Simpson called Pleasure. Pleasure was the name of the gay bar. And all the wonderful um, uh, people who came to the bar would come to the toilet and talk to Val, the toilet attendant, about their worries. And that was just heaven, honestly. It was the leading role and it was written for a woman in her 60s. And I was so proud of that, that wonderful piece and of Mark Simpson for writing it for me. (laughs) That's so you know we 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 keep plugging on we keep plugging on Karen um, to try and uh, get the arts to recognise um, what the potential that is out there. It's very hard when the government is slamming us, uh, slamming culture, slamming the arts every chance they get. Okay. You know they're decimating uh, our fantastic history and tradition and making it impossible for us to grow. Um, with every passing year, there's another threat to the success of, of Britain's cultural scene. And it's tragic because as I travel, I realise talking to different people from different nations that our cultural um, heritage is the envy of the world. Our standards, our musical and dramatic standards uh, are the envy of the world. They're the best in the world. People come here specifically to experience that. Yes. And our government seems to think we're an optional extra and don't really need any attention at all. <laughs> well, hey ho, there we go. We'll keep batting <laughs> on. There we um, go. Well, you have been, you know, you've talked about um, women's rights and things. And I have to say, it's been an absolute inspiration listening to you today. So thank you, Karen. Thank you so, so much. You've been so generous. And Well, I do hope the people of Manchester will come uh, I... to see my fair lady. Now, because Manchester is a little jewel when it comes to commitment to the arts. Your wonderful Halle Orchestra, your fabulous concert series that you have, your brilliant, brilliant uh, dramatic drama uh, schools and dra- and and colleges and commitment to, uh, you know, to, to the arts in general is is a is the envy of everyone and is a beacon, uh, you know, in, in the light <laughs> which we Aww. need. So I'm Thank you. ever so excited to be coming to Manchester, yes. and I hope everybody comes to see us. <laughs> I'm sure they will. And you can catch it from the 22nd of March, so not long to wait, to nope. the 1st of April. And I know I'm coming straight Next off week. the chat to book my tickets. So yes. thank you so, so much. Thank you very much, Leslie. Thank you. Take thank care. You.